Yeah, as you can see, a uh, recording is in progress now. Uh, we welcome everyone and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Rasha Abusita, the Sustainability Program Coordinator at Emerge Guelph. And I would like to begin with the Aboriginal land acknowledgement. I want to acknowledge as we gather here today, we are reminded that Guelph is situated on a treaty land that is steeped in rich indigenous history and home to, to home uh, First Nations, Inuit, and Metis people today. As a community, we have a responsibility for the stewardship of the land on which we live and work, and a responsibility to foster a reconciliation and respect for indigenous people who have been stewards and caretakers for this land for generations. Today, we acknowledge the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, of the Anishinaabe peoples on whose traditional territories we are meeting today. And we encourage folks to continue educating themselves on all current issues facing First Nation communities and peoples across Ontario and Canada. And to learn how to take action to uplift and support indigenous people from cause to cause to cause. So uh, next, uh, this is our agenda for tonight. I would like to thank the city of Guelph for sponsoring this event. Uh, and we are so excited to run the Salty Softener Salty Rivers webinar once again for the second year because of this huge demand and positive feedback from our audience. So thank you all. Now I will hand the mic to Evan Ferrari, our executive director at Emerge Guelph to give his quick intro about Emerge and climate change. Over to you, Evan. Thank you. Thank you, Rasha, and, and, and welcome uh, everyone once again. I just want to briefly uh, give a bit of an intro about Emerge for those of you that may not, may not be aware of us, but uh, our task is to fight climate change. One of the things that we do it is through our home tune-up program, um, where Rasha will actually come to your home and help you build an action plan about how you can reduce your energy and water use in your home and, and fight climate change on a, on a daily basis. We're also the folks behind the 100% renewable Guelph target that uh, the, the, the city has adopted specifically for the, the corporation of the city of Guelph. But we just always like to be clear that 100% renewable doesn't mean that we're just going to um, uh, uh, put solar panels and, and wind turbines on SUVs. More importantly, two thirds of all of the energy that we consume in Canada is wasted two thirds. So what the approach that we're taking instead is that, yes, we wanna reach 100% renewable um, energy, but the only way we can get there is through a very aggressive efficiency and conservation program. Doesn't sound as sexy as, as solar panels or wind turbines, but let, 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 me, let me explain this a little further. If all we did was just put solar panels on the average built home, the amount of solar panels that one home would need would be equivalent to the panels on three houses. So essentially, um, um, we just couldn't do it. These houses here, oddly enough, are actually um, uh, net zero homes, uh, net zero energy. And the reason that they can actually be net zero is because the amount of energy demand in the house or energy efficiency and conservation has been done to such an extent in these homes that uh, that they can actually use just one set of panels on their, uh, on their home in order to offset all of their energy. Essentially, what we need to do is reduce the total demand of energy down to a level that's equivalent to the amount of energy that three TVs, 32-inch LED TVs, would use in the space of a year. It doesn't sound like, a, a, like an awful lot of energy, but those homes that I just showed you um, actually come in at about that level, that that's the amount of energy that it takes to, takes to heat them. And this isn't, this isn't some crazy thing out there, but, and it's not just for new homes. These are the, these are the Brandleys, so Suzanne and Ernst. They have a hundred year old house that uses 60% less energy than a newly built home. Um, and they also use less than half of the water of a typical Guelph bite. And we're gonna to get to the water, uh, uh, water in, this, uh, in, in this program shortly. And this gives you an idea of exactly where they're at. The average Guelph consumption on a per person basis, uh, liters per person per day is 164 liters per person. The so we're doing significantly better than the Ontario average 
And the city of Guelph has a, has a goal of trying to hit 150 liters per, uh, per person per day. The Brandleys are actually at a point where they're only consuming less than 80 uh, liters per, per day. They've changed behaviors. They've invested in efficient technologies. Their home is also certified blue built. And take a look at that. You can find out about that from our website and also on the city website. And they've also been listed on the city's hall of fame as water heroes. Another family, this is, um, this is the Colvins. They doubled the size of their 1980s house and cut their energy use by 40%. Let that, let that one sink in for a bit. So they started with a really inefficient 1980s house. They added another floor on top and they still cut the total energy use by more than 40% compared to what it was when they started with that original thing. They also put on a seven kilowatt solar system, a solar hot water system, installed a 9,100 liter rainwater harvesting system, and they supplement the, their uh, winter space heating with a high efficient wood pellet stove. They've also got something called drain water uh, heat recovery, and you'll have to ask me about that one later. And their water consumption with a household of three and, and two you know, very active boys, even in this situation, they've done a wonderful job of keeping their water consumption significantly lower than the, that, than the Guelph average and way below the Guelph target of 150 liters per person per day. And they too were actually, they were one of the first homes in Guelph to be listed as a blue built home. And as we mentioned, there's the 9,000 liter um, uh, rainwater harvesting system and also efficient appliances and water fixtures. And on that note, I, I wanna introduce where we're going tonight. And where we're going tonight is, um, is, is down a bit of a different path than actually just trying to reduce um, water itself. And I think one of the things that, that we were, uh, that, um, uh, that's gonna be talked about a, a little later on is that whenever we think about salt in our river systems, road salt is the first thing that comes to mind because it's very obvious. It's in our face throughout the winter. It's, you know, it, it's, uh, we have to walk on it or bike on it if we're biking on it. And, and of course it gets all over cars and, and makes a real mess of things. But what we forget about is that, um, is that amount of salt that's being used that's really invisible to us. It's invisible because it's something that we, you know, we put it in, a, we put salt into a container in the basement and we don't see it. And technically, the amount of road salt that's being uh, uh, um, uh, uh, put out there by the city of Guelph is actually on the downward trend, while softener salt is going up. Um, so on that note, I would like to introduce uh, Wayne uh, uh, Brabazon, who's a water efficiency technologist with the region of, of Waterloo. And Wayne comes here, um, uh, has been gracious enough to join us from, from Waterloo region tonight. Um, they too have very um, hard water, um, uh, um, uh, similar to the type of water that we have in Guelph. They too have a large amount of groundwater sources uh, for their water, and they have to also put their treated water back into the back into the Grand River, whereas we put it in the Speed River, but it winds up in the Grand River as well. Um, and 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 Wayne's got some really good insights on the uh, on on. Uh, on what they found out in, in Waterloo region is some great insights and some great expertise on being able to help us reduce the amount of salt that we're consuming in water softeners and also the amount of, of water as well. Um, Wayne, over to you. Thank you, um, Evan. So, um, here we go. Just, uh, get my Hang on. Can everyone, uh, you've got that um, presentation there, Evan? Good. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone, for um, inviting me to present tonight. Um, my, my presentation is entitled Salty Softness, the Guelph Perspective. Um, of course, there is a Guelph focus to this presentation. Um, and the, and the, the connection between Guelph and the region of Waterloo is, um, we often partner on projects because um, we are fairly dependent on groundwater, the region of Waterloo and the city of, of, of Guelph. Uh, we're quite groundwater dependent, uh, which means we, we all use hard water and there's 70% um, um, of homes, uh, that sort of order of magnitude uh, use water softeners. So I'm here to talk about um, the salty effluence of, of water softeners. So, 
the outline of my presentation, the use and impacts of water soft softness, uh, softener efficiencies, and alternate technologies. So quick background, hard water. Um, hard water is uh, caused by calcium and magnesium ions actually combining with uh, sulfates and uh, carbonates. And uh, typically hard water is uh, the scaling is the uh, calcium carbonate and the calcite form of, um, of that. And that's the hard scale that you see that you, uh, most people would be aware of. Um, so in the region of Waterloo, um, uh, the, the median, the middle um, level of hardness is 26 grains per gallon, which is around the 450 parts per million or milligrams per litre. Uh, the US Geological Service states that uh, over 3.5 gra uh, grains per gallon is moderately hard. Um, little quick background on uh, measures. Um, in the US, they call them one gra a, a, a grain per gallon. A grain per US gallon is actually 17 parts per million, 17.1. Most of the softeners are manufactured in the States and they use the grains per gallon measure. In, in Canada, we're metric and we use um, milligrams per litre. Uh, solid, uh, just to, for interest's sake, uh, a, a grain is uh, 0 0.065 grams and of calcium, magnesium, and as I say, uh, typically the carbonate form. So the region of Waterloo, we studied, um, studied water softeners uh, a few years back, probably seven or eight years back. Um, in one of our pumping stations, we set up a test rig, that's what you can see there, to measure the salt and the water usage of, um, of a typical um, water softener you'd purchase um, from a hardware store or a specialty softener store. So if you just look at that photograph there, you'll see there's, um, there's actually three softeners being tested. Um, the, there's three resin, uh, resin tanks with electric, uh, electronic controllers on the top. And to the left of each of those is a brine tank, the large tanks uh, that has the salt. And if you look underneath all of those brine tanks, you'll see a square green, that is the scale uh, that we would measure the, um, the weight of the salt. This was all online, by the way, we download the data right from the public station um, online. Um, and on the backboard, you'll see, uh, you'll see two, two meters, the third one's hidden behind the laptop there. Um, and they measure the effluent water, the regeneration water. Uh, and they were the two things we, we wanted to measure. Um, and on the right is a, a gray unit that measures the hardness. And, and that's how our test rig was set up to analyze salt and water uh, usage, the main, and, and of course this focus uh, of this presentation is on the salt. That's the, uh, the, the contaminant of our aquifers. So an iron exchange, um, water softener. There's a diagram there. Um, basically on the left tank, that's your resin tank. It has plastic beads in there. Uh, they're charged beads. And um, once, once they've been charged, um, they're, they're charged with sodium ions. And as the, as the water on the surface cycle coming in through the pipe on the left there at the top, as the water flows through, um, the sodium ions will get knocked off and the calcium and magnesium ions will cling to the beads. And, and so they're not available to form hard scale, um, but that, that um, resin bed has to be periodically recharged. And um, that's done from salt in a brine tank and it flushes the media bed and recharges it with sodium ions. Uh, and it's a very uh, salty, um, super, what we call in chemistry uh, labs, a super saturated solution, as much salt as you can get um, dissolved in, in water. Um, same, um, same diagram, um, but just describing the, uh, the regeneration phase. So there's a number of um, f um, stages in the regeneration and, and it's programmed in the electronic head there at the top of the resin tank uh, by the manufacturers. But basically it washes any dirt from the mineral tank, the, the salt tank. It recharges the uh, um, the salt tank um, with water and, and it flushes the, um, the calcium, uh, sorry, the, uh, the media bed, flushes the media bed with brine, uh, displacing the calcium and magnesium ions, which are then washed to, to drain. And uh, the final phase of this regeneration cycle is um, uh, re, uh, reloading the, um, the brine tank with water. 
Um, a quick comment on corrosiveness. So there's a thing called the Langelier um, scale. It's a saturation uh, um, a scale. And at one end is um, scaling, at the other end is corrosiveness. So by softening water, we're preventing scale, but we do introduce the um, 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 possibility of uh, corrosiveness. Uh, there is a link there for further information, which is in this uh, presentation. Um, and corrosiveness can cause pinhole, um, pinhole leaking um, problems. Um, so Sunnyside Homes in the region of Waterloo, a big seniors home, uh, they have a lot of problem with pinholing. And in fact, in, in our own family home here in the 5-8 uh, line to the softener, we had, uh, we had a little pinhole leak. And it caused a little bit of a, a small flood, but um, that's, that's due to the change in the chemistry as a result of softening. So impacts on the environment, particularly water. The, the backwash water is quite salty, of course, and that goes to waste, the, 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 the briny solution that uh, regenerated the media bed. Um, the backwashing um, phase um, is a bit, uses about 7% of the home's um, total water use. And, um, and even the water that you're drinking um, that's been softened, uh, there is a small amount of salt in there. I've heard it described, um, I, I heard it was around the 200 ppm, parts per million, and it's about as much salt in a glass of water as you would get, say, in a slice of bread. And of course, as with everything, uh, there is a greenhouse gas cost. And in this case, uh, with salt, with, um, with the, sorry, with the water loss, the regeneration water, it's uh, the pumping and treatment of that water. Um, it's greenhouse gas. Of course, pumping uh, water, they're, they're huge pumps that pump that water to all the houses in a large city. Uh, health impacts. So um, whoever, um, uh, where this study was sourced, there's 300 parts per million of sodium in the water. Um, you know, it's in the 200 to 300 ppm range. Uh, doctors will say that people on low sodium diet, diets should um, should avoid drinking softened water. And it's a good idea to have a hard water spigot in your kitchen. We have one in our house, a 1970s um, Sursa house, and uh, that's what they did. Um, and, and drinking mineralized water um, in one of the, the hard water spigot um, is considered uh, healthier. And of course, your um, your outside bibs um, shouldn't shouldn't be softened, and, and a, a drinking spigot in your kitchen uh, shouldn't be softened. Um, impacts on uh, the environment, in particular, the chlorides. So, salt is sodium chloride. The chloride side um, is, is the problem um, in the aquifer and in the treatment plants. Um, they um, studies have shown sixteen thousand tons of salt from softeners per year uh, in the Tri-Cities, Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge. Um, and the chlorides from, uh, from the salt, from the softening process are not removed at wastewater treatment plants. And these chlorides end up in the river, contaminating the river. Uh, and again, there's a greenhouse, cost, uh, cost, greenhouse gas cost to um, salt um, in the mining treatment and transportation of, of all those bags of salt. Uh, now this diagram here is um, one of our local uh, treatment plants, water treatment plant, um, wastewater treatment plant, the Galt plant, South Cambridge. And basically what this is saying, you'll see the black dotted line there is um, the, chlor the estimation of chloride um, as a result of softeners. And then the red line is the actual chloride levels um, um, calculated, um, um, sampled and, and, and uh, analyzed um, in the treatment plant. And you can see that about half of the wastewater effluent um, um, is um, due to chloride uh, concentrations. Um, sorry, half of all the wastewater effluent um, is chloride concentrations. Just And um, about 15% or up to a quarter of the chloride in local waterways um, from residential softens. So, this diagram shows some typical water softeners that we all should recognize. The one on the left, the blue one, is um, a console unit where the resin tank is inside the brine tank. It's uh, more aesthetically pleasing and it's a smaller footprint, but it's still the same principle of operation. The white one on the right is your typical setup, the resin tank, the brine tank separated. The one in the middle is a Kinetico unit. This is a brand, but its, it's principle of operation is quite different. It has two resin tanks um, and it does not have it. You do not need to plug it into the hydro. It, um, the clock mechanism runs uh, hydro, hydro, hydraulically um, by water. 
flowing. And, um, and so when one resin tank is uh, expended, capacity is used up, it will just flip to the other resin tank. And, um, and typically softeners are set to run at 2 a.m. in the morning, so that doesn't impact on family water usage. But in this case, the kinetic coat can just get running uh, continuously. Um, so, uh, providing soft water continuously, and uh, but they are quite expensive. So this is just um, a little description uh, of, of the source of efficiencies in water softeners. Some of the old, you'll see all sorts of softeners in people's basements, but some of the um, the older ones are what we call time based. They're just uh, timer based. They're just clock based. They'll just go every two or three or four days. They don't know how much water has flowed, how much water has been softened. They're the least efficient because they can be running when they don't need to. Uh, mechanical demand regeneration, they have more settings and you can set a volume that's expected to be used in a family of your size with a certain level of hardness. Um, somewhat more efficient, but the one on the right is what is commonly available, demand initiated regeneration. And they, um, they have a wire. Um, uh, do an impeller in the back of the head there, and they'll measure the actual volume and um, of water flowing, and um, and they know the hardness in the in your area, and they will regenerate when needed. So they know if you're on vacation and there's no one using water, they will also know if you've got lots of visitors and lots of water is being used. Um, so typical softener problems. Uh, I mean, a softener leaking and draining constantly, that would be because of some sort of component failure uh, that can happen. Of course, the, the next point there, softener regenerates too often, um, which of course we use more water and salt. And, and that, that alludes to what I was describing before and in, in, in the sort of softener you have, that you need one with some, a certain le level of smarts that can um, soften when needed. Uh, settings not set properly, wrong hardness. We do have a, um, a web page, um, and I'll talk about this in a moment, um, that um, tells you the softness, uh, the, the hardness in your area, and so you can set the softener appropriately. Uh, unnecessary softening of, for instance, the outside bibs, the irrigation uh, taps in your home, uh, and, and, and as I mentioned, drinking water taps. You don't have to soften a uh, drinking water tap. So again, uh, appropriate plumbing set up in your house. Um, inefficient time is set to backwash recharge too often. That would be sort of settings, manufacturer settings. Manufacturers can sometimes set softeners to use um, more salt than they need to, perhaps because they, they, it's, it's all one industry. They sell the salt as well. Um, uh, not putting salt in the tank, that can happen. Um, in our own house, we soften. We have some rental properties uh, and... Um, we don't soften them because there's some issues with who's going to maintain this softener, who's going to put the uh, um, fill it up. And an exhausted red resin bed where it, it kind of the plastic beads go to like a mush, like a porridge in time. You should definitely get your 10 years out of them, perhaps 12 ish years. If you have an old softener that's 20, 25 years old, it's probably not working very well. And it's always, it's like a lot of appliances, it's always a good idea to upgrade. You will get something that's more efficient on the, uh, on the costs. Solutions um, to the problems. So, um, of course, when you have a softener, at least read the owner's manual. Um, it will basically tell you to set the hardness. It will tell you uh, when you, you want it to run, typically 2 a.m. Uh, in the morning. And, and just make sure you've um, done the right settings for what's available to you with the, uh, the buttons on the controller. Um, if you suspect problems or you suspect you're not getting um, soft water, then uh, you know call a plumber or a, the water softener companies all do service calls. Um, it can be prudent to do every few years. And of course, buy more. If your softener is at end of life, we suspect um, uh, it's just been there too long, um, buy a more efficient softener. Um, you can follow the, um, the big box hardware stores and um, they, um, they have sales and what have you and just get a demand initiated uh, softener. You use a lot less salt and you have to cut, uh, carry those bags down to the basement. So water softener improvements, um, as per a study by the Madison Metropolitan Sewer District, um, they found that replacing your water softeners, for instance, with a demand initiated uh, model, um, you can get savings in the 25 to 50% range of the amount of salt you're using. And, and people will say that they use 
you know, four or five bags in a whole year, whereas before they might have been using 12 bags or more. Um, so we have a web page called watersoftenerfacts.ca. And on that web page, it talks to the, um, the NSF uh, ANSI 44 performance standard, which states uh, softeners must remove a minimum of 4,000 grains of hardness per pound of salt used and use no more than four US gallons of water per thousand grains of hardness removed. Now, there are alternatives to salt-based iron exchange water softening. And there were studies done some years back uh, by research um, groups in the States. And they looked at electrically induced precipitation, electromagnetic water treatment, capacitive deionization. They all use a, a certain amount of energy, some of them a lot of energy. And the one that proved most um, um, fortuitous was um, it's two, two words saying the same thing, nucleation assisted crystallization or template assisted nucleation. Basically what that's doing is it's against media, it's coated plastic beads with a ceramic coating. It's, it's causing calcium carbonates can, can, um, crystals can form, but they don't form and get thicker and thicker and form hard scale. They just microscopically cleave off and go to waste. And so they're, they're anti-scale devices. They're not water softening. So your water is still hard. Um, so the Waterloo Regions approach, and here's the, some approaches you can consider. Don't soften your water at all. I mentioned that in our own home, we soften in the rental properties. Um, we don't, that just means we have to change aerators and shower heads uh, somewhat more often. Um, make your softeners more efficient, upgrade to demand initiated models. Um, they're, they're only gonna soften when needed. Um, consider alternatives like the NAC TAC alternatives. Um, there's stores in, I know in Kitchener that sell these units. They're, they're salt free, um, anti-scale uh, anti units. Um, a program we have in the region of Waterloo that I'll quickly talk about in the next few slides is soften the hot water only. This is an alternative. You just soften the hot water so you're not getting scaling in your hot water tanks that so comes with an energy cost. Um, you're just softening the hot water and you're, you're dealing with um, hard water and, and cold water and a mix. Uh, another option is select, what I call selective water softening. Um, um, dishwashers, you can buy dishwashers with inbuilt um, softening. They have a small softening unit inside the dishwasher. So I'm just softening water to the dishwasher but I'm showering and doing my laundry in, in, in hard water. Um, this program of softening the hot only, some, uh, we did some studies and found the savings could be in a typical household of uh, three people, $39 on the water side, $45 per year on the salt side, a total of $84 a year of savings. And in, in broad numbers, this is a saving of um, 8,800 uh, 8,800 litres per year of water saved, uh, 108 kilo, kilograms of salt and greenhouse gas CO2 equivalents of uh, 48 uh, tonnes, 48 kilograms, sorry. So the pilot program, just giving you a quick overview um, that we're experimenting with in the region of Waterloo, uh, 2020 to 2023, convert to um, soft and hot only, uh, you get a one-time rebate of $50, convert 1,225 households, save 10,000 cubic metres of backwash water per year, uh, save 126 tonnes of salt per year and reduce greenhouse gas emissions to the equivalent of 56 tonnes per year. Uh, the payback on this um, um, coming rebate is uh, with a $50 rebate, a three-person household that spent $200 for the conversion will see a payback in around two years. And again, it's a pilot program and uh, we're in the middle of the pilot program. But the status to May of this year was, um, this, these are softening. Um, we distribute hardness um, test strips, uh, much like a swimming pool test strip. It's just a dipstick. And um, it, it, this can become a lead in to the um, um, soften hot water only program. Uh, so we've distributed 730 of these test kits um, 18 households have actually moved on to softening the hot only. And, and some of the data we found from uh, surveys was 20% of households are softening the outdoor tap. That's something you don't need to do. You probably shouldn't do for the health of your garden. 
21 percent of stock in the drinking water tap and as mentioned it's a good idea to ha have a hard water tap in your kitchen for health reasons and some people are softening the cold water but not the hot which is kind of back to front you really need to protect that hot water system because now it's going to start hitting you in the uh, energy uh, energy pocket so uh, check out watersoftenerfacts.ca. It, um, it's a joint web, website initiative by the region of Waterloo and the city of Guelph. And um, it talks so about the study results of that test rig, the, the picture I showed you of the uh, testing the three softeners at once. Um, it also describes how water softeners work. It has a buyer's guide in there, uh, not mentioning brands, but, but what to look for in the size of the softener. And most importantly, it has low, local water hardness maps. And so you can look up the hardness in your area um, and, and you need that number to program into the, um, into the machine. The, the software. So kind of to wrap up, um, so as mentioned, I'm, um, my name is Wayne Brabazon. I'm a technologist at the Regional Waterloo, focusing on the water efficiency side of things. Uh, that's my contact email. And I, this is gonna lead into uh, Steve Yassi of Guelph, um, City of Guelph presentation. And if you have any questions, could you please hold them to uh, the convener invites questions. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. That, that was that was great. That was great, Wayne. The, the, the questions are coming in fast and furious, and uh, and uh, I'll, I'll reiterate uh, what Wayne had mentioned that uh, that we'll, we'll we'll take them at the end. Uh, but who I'd, who I'd like to to um, to introduce you to, and I think some of you may know may know uh, our, our next speaker, and that's Steve Yesi. He's a water conservation uh, program coordinator with the city of Guelph. And uh, Steve is also a former uh, Emerge staffer here uh, for, for, for many years. And we were sorry to see him go, but he didn't go very far because we're always in contact with him around uh, uh, water conservation and, and, and efficiency things um, on, a, on a regular basis. And uh, he always likes to get into a conversation about energy conservation and EVs, needless to say, as part of it as well. And I, I think what you're gonna find is, is uh, this is sort of a one-two punch between Wayne and Steve today that, uh, you know, bookending the issue of, of uh, of, uh, of the salt that we're dealing with in our rivers and, and what we can do to mitigate it. So uh, Steve, welcome once again and hand it over to you. Well, uh, as, as always, thanks for having me. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll, I'll piggyback on, on everything that, that Wayne said. And so looking at the impacts and alternatives to residential softening in Waterloo Region and Guelph, uh, a little background. Uh, in 2016, an uh, environmental, environmental impact study was completed, which found that both the Speeda and the Grand Rivers were approaching chronic exposure limits to, to chlorides. And the, the largest culprits to, to those chlorides were winter road salting and, and water softening. Now, I know the topic of the day is water softening, but uh, as Evan mentioned right at the top, uh, road salting uh, tends to dominate the conversation when we talk about chlorides in, in waterways, whether it's lakes, rivers, streams, you name it. Um, I challenge everyone when this is done, take a quick Google search of the internet to take a quick Google search of news articles that exist around Ontario or Canada and, and salt uh, in our waterways and and look for how many times softening is mentioned because it's, it's few and far between. I did a quick one today and, and couldn't find it at all. Um, so I, I think we have to touch on this a little bit and absolutely uh, winter road salts add to the salt within our waterways. Um, but uh, over the last few years, I would say this is actually one of the really good news stories. Uh, the report I mentioned came out in 2016. So looking at the winter of 2017, right to the, the last winter, 2020, 2021, we've been able to reduce uh, the salt application on our roads, essentially from about 11 million kilograms down to less than 6.5 million kilograms. And again, uh, a really good news story uh, from the perspective of reducing our salt use and, and, and using salt wisely in our cities. And this can't just be Guelph. Uh, I can't say for certain that other cities have had the same success, but I would have to imagine over, over a similar time period um, and, and the way that uh, cities tend to, to share our, our knowledge and, and our, our best practices, this is not unique to Guelph and, and a really good news story that's happening all over the place. And now, of course, we have to salt the roads in the winter. It's finding that balance between uh, public safety and environmental protection. We can't have cars, you know, getting into accidents just because we want to to 
reduce that that salt load. Um, and public health, public protection is is paramount. But how that salt has combed down over the years is a variety of, of things. One is classifying roads, um, looking at the classification of roads and salting them a little differently. And so we have the arterial roads or main roads that are going, going to get more salt than other roads um, simply because there's more, more traffic flow on them. And then if you're on an off street, a, a residential street that doesn't see a lot of traffic, the chances are those roads are going to get less salt. And so the cities are saving salt that way. Um, there's all sorts of factors that go into salting roads in terms of including temperature. Um, we've, we've increased our brine application as well. And the brine application, um, there is a certain temperature range that we can use it in, but it's, it's a lot less salt going on the roads to, to be effective at, at maintaining our roads and making sure that, that they're not slippery and, and cars aren't going to hit icy patches or run into each other. Um, equipment maintenance. I always say, you know, whether it's a car, uh, Wayne talked about the equipment maintenance of, of softeners, uh, whether it's your furnace in your home, good maintenance on your equipment uh, makes it run effectively and makes it run efficiently. And so having uh, our, our vehicles maintained and working optimally also helps us not over salt roads. And then finally, we live in the, the, the age of data. And so we have GIS trackers on all our trucks. We have an understanding of how much uh, salt is going on the roads and what streets it's going on. And that has allowed us to, to really dig down and uh, understand where our salt is being applied and, and apply it smartly. And of course, if, if you're using sidewalks in the, in the wintertime, we're not using pure salt, rock salt anymore. It's a salt sand mixture. So anywhere we can reduce, we have. And again, uh, a good news story, but it, this tends to dominate the news in terms of um, our, our salty waterways. And, and to take a look at that a little differently, that uh, orange line there is the road salt just since 2018. Pretty massive decrease. Um, it doesn't look like much from the softener side in terms of an increase. Uh, but I would keep in mind that Guelph and Kitchener Waterloo are places to grow. We expect a, a pretty substantial increase uh, compared to where we are today in the inflow of people moving to our cities. And with that, we're, you know, we're building accommodations, we're building condos, we're building houses. And as people move in, uh, you have to assume that uh, a lot of these houses, a lot of these multi-residential properties will also be including softeners. And so uh, as our population looks to almost double over the next 20 years, um, softener and, and salt use uh, will increase as well. Hopefully it will not double. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll look at options and there will be new and better options to come. But um, we have the technologies of the day today and we have to look at those. Uh, but what I think is interesting as well is uh, with that decrease in road salting, we're almost looking at a parity point where we'll see maybe this winter uh, road salting will be able to decrease uh, as it's seen a consistent decrease over the last four or five years um, where softening salt that, that ultimately ends up in, in our waterways uh, may match what's going on our roads uh, or surpass what's going on our roads. And again, uh, the, the challenge to look at in the news and, and see where softeners are mentioned because they, they tend to be neglected um, and, and neglected for a variety of reasons. Now, the reason we use uh, so many softeners in the region of Waterloo and the city of Guelph as Wayne mentioned, we're groundwater-based communities. So the region of Waterloo, 75 to 80% of, of the water uh, is groundwater-based. Guelph is almost exclusively groundwater-based. And so 70 to 80% of our households across both jurisdictions use softeners. Uh, and from a household perspective, uh, again, across the region of Waterloo and the city of Guelph, that's 181,000 households. Uh, that are using softeners, uh, contributing salt, and, and each individual home uh, uses approximately 175 to 200 kilograms of salt per year. Um, and we haven't talked a ton about uh, water savings, uh, but the, it ends up being 2 billion liters of backwash water that essentially uh, gets used by the system and goes, goes right to drain. Um, we'll talk, uh, I'll, I'll certainly talk about NACTAC here, but what brought us to some of these alternative technologies wasn't actually looking at, at the salt use. Uh, it was looking at the water savings that, that ultimately ended at the partnership between the region of Waterloo and the city of Guelph to, to study NACTACs. And so 
Wayne uh, discussed nucleation assisted crystallization, template assisted crystallization, better known as NACTAX. Um, I won't get into softening too much uh, because Wayne explained it, but really your water in a softener is flowing through that resin. It's, it's holding on to the magnesium and calcium. And then uh, when that media gets saturated, you're running that, that salt brine through it to go to waste. The, the NACTAC, on the other hand, it, it works very similarly in that you have water uh, that's passing through a media, uh, the, the media hangs on to that magnesium and calcium, and it, it, it kind of grows, we'll say, collects on that media uh, to a certain size, it breaks off and enters into the, uh, basically into your household plumbing. And so uh, sometimes these systems are referred to as, as saltless water softeners, but I would say they are not saltless water softeners. I, we very specifically refer to them as conditioners because the water that moves forward is not soft. It is hard water that goes through. Um, however, the magnesium and calcium are ionized in such a way that, that they don't create the scale that we're, we're used to in, in hard water cities. And in fact, they tend to descale the plumbing. Uh, when these are first installed, there is discoloration to the water because it, it will descale um, not just the plumbing, but uh, water heaters, uh, dishwashers, you name it. Um, and so in 2017, 2018, we did a market research study. And this wasn't to study the effectiveness of of the, the technology. We had determined that this is, is uh, an effective technology, but how would, would people um, take this technology on? How would they like it uh, from a use perspective? And so within this study, uh, we had 18 households between the, uh, the region of Waterloo and the city of Guelph, nine in Guelph, nine in the region of Waterloo. Uh, and they represented different homes, ages of homes, uh, different types of, of families, families of five, families of two. So using uh, different amounts of water at different times of the year. What I would call attention to is those, those two pictures on screen. The one on the left-hand side is your traditional, again, your traditional softener. Um, the one on the right hand side is the NACTAC and they could easily be mistaken. You could be in someone's home uh, and know quite a bit about softeners and look at a NACTAC and just think, hey, look, there's another softener. Um, but uh, those are very different technologies despite, despite how they look. And so the results of the study after years uh, of a year's worth of time in these households, uh, the participants were given the opportunity to keep it if, if they liked it. And 13 of the 18 participants opted to, opted to keep the equipment in their home, which at first blush seems really great for, for the technology. However, three of the 13 or three of the 18 became ambassadors. So these are the types of people that would tell their families and friends if they had a dinner party, they'd, they'd bring people down to look at their, their knack tack. Uh, they loved it, um, which is great. 10 of the people in the study uh, acknowledged drawbacks. There were, there were uh, aspects of the technology and, and how they went about their daily life that, that were frustrating, uh, but for various reasons, they opted to keep it. And, and I'll discuss that a, a little bit later. And then uh, five, five people opted to have it removed. And so we use the net promoter score as a, a pretty industry standard measure of, of a product or a service and how people like it and, and whether or not it's going to succeed. Uh, generally, you want a positive net promoter score. The, the more positive the score, the, the more likely uh, the success of that product or service. In this case, we had a negative net promoter score, which isn't isn't a, a fantastic or ringing endorsement of, of the technology. Um, and so from the feedback from the participants is there, there were certainly a lot of advantages. And, and again, Wayne's touched on some of these in cost savings. So you're not running that regen cycle. Uh, there is uh, water being saved. And so, you know, the cost savings associated with water, you're not paying for salt. Um, which is great. And, and the maintenance is pretty limited because there's no moving parts uh, in, in the NACTAC. Um, along with that maintenance, there's just no lugging heavy bags, the, the salt bags. I mean, the, they're significantly heavy enough that when you have to carry anywhere from six to 12 bags over the course of the year, it, it, it comes a bit of a pain in the butt, quite frankly. And so removing that from the equation is always nice. A sense of pride. Um, where that comes in is, uh, again, Evan alluded to softeners kind of being this black box in the basement. Um, you know, we add salt and, and then we leave. We forget about it until we need to add more salt and people don't think about it. And, and there were uh, several people in the study who, who 
had concern for the environment. And while it made perfect sense that this salt eventually went to drain and, and made its way to our waterways, it's not something that anyone had, had stopped to think about. Because um, to be quite frank, why, why would most people stop to think about where that salt went? It's, it's similar, similarly, we don't think often where our water comes from so long as when we turn on the tap water comes out or where the water goes so long as when we flush the toilet, it, it leaves our house. Um, out of sight, out of mind is, is kind of the nature of the game for water, uh, despite the fact that it is, is, is so, so, so pertinent and pervasive in our, in our lives uh, every day. Um, ability to drink water from any tap. Again, Wayne touched on the, the idea that uh, a lot of homes have hard water uh, lines in their kitchen. Uh, those are the, the lines that people tend to grab glasses of water from because there's not that, that minute salt, salt content in it. Um, and so they tend to cook with that water as well. This descaling of the plumbing fixtures, as I mentioned before, um, we always, I always found it funny. It's great that it descales it. It's, it's protective for your, your appliances. Uh, it, it descaled one of the participants. It actually created a leak in their house because scale was holding together one of their taps. And so when they first uh, ran the knack tack in the house, uh, it, it descaled that tap and created the leak. So perhaps a little frustrating for that participant, but a good indication that the technology was, was working as it should. Now the drawbacks, the biggest one that came up over and over again and, and really was the frustration, uh, that the main frustration point was dishwashers. Um, when the calcium and magnesium come off off those resin beads and, and enter into kind of the, the household plumbing stream, um, it doesn't create scale, but it does create kind of a fine white powder. And it's it's really simple to wipe off with a, a dry or wet cloth um, with no effort. However, that does come across in, in dishes. And, and on top of the fact that sometimes it comes a little spottier, people found. Um, and uh, the additional work to remove those spots or to have to wipe off the, the that fine powder was frustrating uh, for a lot of people. The hard water feel um, for a lot of people that are used to soft, uh, soft water in their showers, you know, it was very noticeable for them and, and not something they liked. And no indication the system is working. Uh, there is certainly an, an initial indication when, when things are being descaled and, and the water becomes a little bit discolored as you flush your lines. Uh, but at a certain point, the resin within that uh, water conditioner will be spent. It will need to be replaced. But there's no bells. There's no whistles. There's just no indication of when that time period is. And so you're kind of left with, uh, you know, switching it out every three or four years. Um, how does that, how is that affected by that, the number of people in the household? It, it's not quite clear. Um, and then finally, it wasn't a mainstream technology there's various uh, issues with this one is you know will it affect the sale of my home will people come in and just not know what it was and, and will it scare people off or just create just that much more of a barrier if, if i'm looking to sell my home um on top of the, the fact that if again if you look online specifically for these they might it might be getting a little bit better now uh but certainly in 2018 when we had uh had been in the midst of this study it was quite difficult to to find these even if you were looking for it and looking to research it and so again um wayne mentioned that the region of waterloo and the and the city of guelph have put together that watersoftener.ca website to to discuss water softeners um and if you're looking for your hardness in guelph or the region you can find your neighborhood or, or a section of your city to figure out what your grains per gallon is so that you can appropriate appropriately set your your softener at home um, but ultimately, where does this leave us? Um, it, it's, it's gray as, as many things are, um, the technology works. I would say plain and simple, the technology works, but it doesn't mean that everyone will be happy with it. It, it works as it's intended. Um, but the net promoter score at a negative 18 shows that there's a lot, a lot of people that, that weren't happy with the way it worked. Um, I might suggest that that some of that has to do with with uh, perceptions going in. If people think that they're going to get soft water out of a water conditioner, or or they've been told it's a saltless water softener, um, it, there's it's misinformed, right? There's misinformation there, and so if they know that what what to expect is hard water, is the hard water feel in showers, um, you're setting people up to be a little bit more uh, accepting of of what's to come. Uh, but will there be a strong salt reduction uh, from these, this, these, 
the NAC tax in the future, it's hard to say. If, if, if people aren't buying them and installing them, then, then it's not going to result in salt, salt savings that we, we hope to see uh, from, from households locally and, and from our neighbors down, down the road. Um, right now in Guelph, there's no specific incentive, uh, and the region of Waterloo, there's no specific incentive for um, NAC tax. Uh, the net promoter score uh, wasn't one that, that uh, provided a lot of confidence to to really dig in on this front. Um, however, we do have a, the Water Smart Business Program, which is focused on the the institutional, commercial, and industrial side of things. Uh, so, from a commercial standpoint, uh, if a, a company installs a piece of equipment or replaces a piece of equipment and 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 can prove that water savings, there there is an incentive. Uh, for that technology. We have seen some of these NAC tax go in some multi-residential buildings um, and, and have seen some pretty significant salt savings from, from those properties because they're, they're feeding so many residents um, in, in that building. Uh, it's, it's nice to see the salt savings and nice, of course, nice to see the, the water savings coming from the, the water conservation background. Uh, the city is currently updating our water efficiency strategy uh, that should, I believe, come out in 2022. And so right now everything's on the table. We're looking at all the options. Uh, we do particularly well and the region of Waterloo does particularly well with water use. Uh, we've been working at it for many years and, and we're leaders in Ontario. We're certainly leaders in the country and, and um, in Guelph and the region are, are sometimes pointed to when, we, when we're in seminars in the States because uh, of how little water we use comparatively. Um, so we get to that point by looking at, at all our options and having them on the table. So um, we're keeping those eyes open and, and eager for, for what's to come. And of course, of course, we're, we're monitor, monitoring. Uh, I'm listen, listening to Wayne every time we get to present and he gets to talk about that, uh, that rebate, that $50 rebate for the, the plumbing incentive, um, listening pretty closely to, to see how that's coming along um, because there's, there's significant salt savings from that as well. Uh, with that, I will maybe kick it back to, to you, Evan, and, uh, and hope we can answer some questions. Fabulous. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Really appreciate that. Uh, Wayne, do you want to join us again? Um, if you put your camera back on and your mic on, you could come in on join us. We have uh, quite a number of questions already in the queue. And Wayne, the first one goes out to you, and it's coming from Art. Um, and uh, Art um, mentioned that uh, you referred to the, uh, uh, the, the effluent water coming out of a recharge unit as salty. And salt, Art has actually tasted the water coming from a Kinetico, and he found that it tastes saltless. So he was wondering why you call it salty. Yeah. Um, no, there is, in the service cycle of a water softener, the, uh, the calcium and magnesium ions are being clinging on to the media bed and there is a small amount of salt um, end up in the water. And I actually had to analyze at one point and it was 170 parts per million of, of uh, sodium. A hundred, it was, a, so we did a sodium analysis, it was 170, um, oh, that's where the discrepancy of the 300 ppm would be. Um, I'm not sure that would be sodium chloride, but um, sodium levels were 170 parts per million uh, in drinking water of softened water. And it was described to me as being about as much salt in a glass of water as a slice of bread. So in the service cycle, this is nothing to do with regenerating, nothing to do with the brine tank running. This is just the water's going through the softener and, and grabbing the calcium and magnesium, the sodium ions have to go somewhere. That's an undeniable fact. They're not just vaporizing. The sodium ions have to come out of the, in the water, and it does to the tune of 170 parts per million of sodium ions. Now, I've measured that. Yeah. Great. Th thank you. Um, and, and maybe it's not really salty as, as we describe salty, <laughs> but it's there. The sodium ions are indeed there. They have to be there. Art just isn't sensitive enough, sensitive enough to taste the. Well, that, that, yeah, yeah, exactly. It, 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 it's there, but it's not really um, um, uh, something we would notice. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, Patrick has a question. He says, if you only soften um, hot water, you will mix the hot with the cold. So uh, won't scale build up on, yeah. um, yeah. uh, on, on some of the, your, your shower heads and some of your appliances? Yeah, and I did mention that they, they, they will be a blend. So what happens in restaurants, and I observed this all 10 years ago, when you go in, and, and the work I was doing in restaurants, when you go into a restaurant, they will typically, some are softening everything now, but typically they would just soften the hot water only. And that's because they're protecting the hot water system. That's where you get your biggest bang for your buck. When that, when that hot water system, because of high temperature, in, in, um, speeds up thermodynamics, um, you get much more scaling, much faster in a hot water tank, and that scale makes it hard to heat the water. So restaurants soften the hot water only. But when you get your sink, the big tub sinks and you've got hot and cold, yeah, you've got scaling there because you're mixing soft, hot with hard, cold. And you, yeah, you've got less scaling, but you're still going to have scaling for sure. It's just the rationale is I'm protecting my hot water system where I'm getting energy safe. But yeah, you're still going to have scaling problems to a lesser degree. You're still going to have to change those aerators, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Thanks. I, I, I'm going to I'm going to um, hand this one over to or over to Steve. The next one, and, and Steve, it's actually from my brother, from my older brother, who's who's recently moved to the region, uh, uh, Wayne. So he hasn't had to deal with. He, he came from a part part of Ontario that didn't need uh, water softeners. Uh, but my brother Joe asks, uh, what about damage to household appliances, faucets, clothes washers, and ice makers? Um, if if you don't soften, I'm gonna take oh, that. Is that that's Steve. Steve. If yeah. you don't soften and you're not using, uh, not, if just it's it's a hard water system. A am I correct in, in assuming that yes. if it's just that's running hard water? Yeah. Um, uh, it's it's. I wouldn't say it's difficult. Yeah, there's going to be scale buildup in 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 your system to to some extent with dishwashers, uh, washing machines, and uh, water heaters. It, it, Wayne talked about the uh, Langelier scale, so there's questions as to for a water heater whether it's it's best to to soften water and 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 have that corrosion versus having that scale. Um, and in terms of the other appliances in the house. Absolutely, the, the hard water is going to have wear and tear on it for sure. With with uh, scale, there's a few things people can do. I think um, putting vinegar in with with either the the laundry load or the dishwasher is very helpful. Actually, even with the NACTAC uh, equipment that I, I spoke about and, and people's frustration with the dishwasher, within those focus groups, people did share. You know, when you put in a, a small cup of vinegar, that tended to get rid of that the spotty issues. Um, uh, and, and some of those complaints. Uh, and so that goes back to kind of maintaining your equipment. Yeah, there's going to be there, the hard water is going to come with scale. There are certain things you can do to help keep your, your equipment uh, maintained. Um, vinegar is, is our friend when it comes to some of that scale buildup. Um, um, yeah, the other piece to it is, of course, there's uh, uh, equipment where if you don't want to put a softener in your home, you can get a dishwasher. Uh, Evan, as you know very well, you can get a dishwasher that has a, a built-in softener. And so you're softening that water where it's perhaps needed most in that equipment to provide that long lifespan. But the salt you would otherwise use in that equipment is it's, um, far reduced from what you would having to um, soften your entire home. That, thanks, Steve. And in full disclosure, yes, I, I, we don't soften uh, all of our water here. We do just soften the water that goes into, sorry, our dishwasher has a built-in um, water softener. And it's uh, a 1.2 kilo box that we put into it about five or six times a year. So significantly a, a, a smaller amount of salt. And is there some degree of, of buildup? There is. And, and Steve, I, I, absolutely. We use vinegar. We have vinegar in a spray bottle and use it a, a lot for cleaning and helping to get rid of the, uh, help getting, get, getting rid of the scale. Uh, there's another question here, but it, it seems to have already been, been dealt with. Um, Steve uh, Jacobs, uh, if um, if you only soften hot, then change. Sorry, if you, if you only soften hot, then change um, to hot water wa uh, clothes washing. Then isn't it more isn't more energy used? Um, if uh, if cold water is used, more is more soap needed. And what is the what is the most environmentally sustainable way to wash clothes? 
who wants to take that one? This is where it gets really confusing, right? Um, and this is, you know, living in the gray of, of everything that goes on. Yeah, if I mean, we've all been conditioned to hear that we should be washing our clothes with cold water, right? Um, and, and it's associated with energy use in, in heating that water. And so if, if you're switching to hot, there's more energy use. Um, if you're switching to hot, there's, there's perhaps, perhaps you can get away with less soap use. Um, you would have to be pretty vigilant. I, I don't, I don't, you don't know a whole lot of people who, who pay that close attention to how much soap they use. You fill it to the line and away you go. So, I mean, theoretically, you could maybe reduce that a bit. Um, I, again, I, I would default to, um, to, to vinegar. You might be able to stay with that, that cold water use. Uh, you, your bills for vinegar might go up a little bit uh, within that but it, it will maintain that equipment if uh, you're looking to opt away from uh, the energy side of things in terms of, you know, typically heating our water with, with gas. Um, so it, you're kind of giving up one for the other and, and measuring which is best for your household, which is best for you personally, um, and even using the tips and tricks within that, the, being the vinegar and just properly maintained equipment um, to, to try to get the lifespan out of that equipment that, that we can. Great, great, thank you. And, and uh, Wayne, I think we had a chemist in, in the audience here. Gail Edwards says that the chemistry designation for magnesium is MG and not MA. I think there was a, was there a typo in your, in your presentation? No, I don't think it was in, um, I, I thought it was in, um, it was then, sorry. It was um, on my slide. There's a the photo page, that we yeah. use, and it's actually from the the, the water softener facts uh, website. And it's it's a it's a phenomenal catch because I caught that myself today. Um, re reacquainting myself with the periodic table because I thought, what is MA? Uh, it, in the exact same picture, it does say MG. But yeah, they're right. Good eye. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, ex laboratory, Evan. Uh, that wouldn't uh, that wouldn't be in my my slide. <laughs> Okay. All right. Then it was Steve's fault. Then. No. Well, well no. I, yeah. Um, yeah. No. I. I know what um, magnesium and man manganese is M N. So. Um, yeah. Yes. It's not. Uh, yeah, there is no M A on the periodic table. No. Right? No. There's not. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, uh, thanks, Gail, for that, uh, for that, uh, um, for that little interlude I, there. Evan, if I could just make a comment on the chemistry yep. side, just that discussion of vinegar. Vinegar is simply a weak acid. All you're doing is dissolving, dissolving the spikes. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure. I mean, basically, if you've got some a little bit of spot, yeah, and you put in vinegar, you're just dissolving it. I mean, it's nothing's been removed. It's just <laughs> put back in solution. Yeah, all this guy. So it's a bit of a uh, yeah. And the other thing I wanted to mention, um, and and uh, I'm not sure who can answer this question. My wife would answer it better than me. But isn't most washing now in washing machines done in cold water? And I think all the detergents are made to wash in cold. I think most washing's done in cold. I better my understanding. Can I, can I, if I could just interject for a second, Rasha, I'm wondering, could you set up a poll? Uh, it'd be interesting to poll everyone that's here today. Um, and um, if, if you're able to do that, Rasha, then um, uh, uh, so while we're chatting, if you uh, give it a shot to see if you can put it together, it, it, it'd be very interesting to see because. Um, uh, yeah. I, I, that, that's my understanding as well, but we could be, we could be very wrong on that. Um, and then yeah. David has a question. Um, does reverse osmosis treatment require softened water? Oh, I can answer this. So you need to know your chemistry. Again, um, softening is, is very specific. It's removing ions, specifically calcium and magnesium ions. RO is removing all the ions. So a lot of factories have a, a process where they'll, they'll, soften, they'll take out the calcium and magnesium because the water is so hard. And then they'll, they'll, that's cation exchange. Then they'll run it through anion exchange and take out sulfates and carbonates. And then they'll run it through RI and take out, you know, all sorts of other ions. I mean, there's many ions and our water in our area is highly mineralized. So calcium and magnesium is just two of the ions. Once you do all of the total dissolved solids, RO will take out all, all the ions. And so um, it's just 
But RO is never a good solution because RO is about a 50-50 on for every lead, uh, two litres that you put in, you're only getting one litre out. So they're dreadfully um, um, wasteful on water. But they, they're, um, they're taking out all the ions, all the uh, dissolved ions, the plus one, you know, the, the ions in our water, which is basically just the ions that are dissolved out of rocks, out of uh, aquifer, aquifer sediments. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the issue on the efficiency side of it. So you're using a heck of a lot of water, or you're wasting a heck of a lot of water in order to get water out of it. And I, yeah, and, I, and these soft, I mean, I, I don't know who's in the audience, but I mean, a good um, water conditioning softening company, you know, they would like to sell you um, um, dechlorinators, um, water softeners, the salt, um, and, and, and um, you know, that's their business is to take everything out of the water. Well, everything doesn't necessarily have to be taken out of the water. The chlorine's not a bad thing to have there. That's why we don't have disease in our water. Uh, um, you know, um, water doesn't have to be 100% pure, so as to right. speak. Right, right. Um, got a quick question from uh, Sydney. Um, hi, Sydney, by the way. Um, she purchased a, a device called a Calamat. It's a small box, like an electronic device that attaches to yeah. the main water pipe and, and two copper wires that wrap around the pipe. I believe that it affects the ionization of the scale. Is this like a NACTAC device or the equivalent? No, it's not. And uh, you keep believing that, Sydney, because they're, 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 they're sort of somewhat, and again, I don't know who's in the audience, but they are, those sort of systems are very sort of snake oil kind of sales. Um, they typically, we don't endorse them the region. They typically, they might have some uses in large industrial areas with large systems, but they're, 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 my argument would be they're really quite placebo. I okay. think it's, yeah, because um, they really um, are not proven um, devices. Um, and the sort of voltages they're applying and, and that, I mean, they will sell those units, but they, um, they're they really not doing a lot for water. And we certainly don't endorse them at the region. Okay, I was curious. I did buy one, I got it at Home Depot and it was not that expensive when I bought it, but I just have a very small basement and don't want a water softener and yeah. just trying to deal with something that's beneficial. Yeah, I, I guess that their was, approach is that anti, it's their anti-scale approach. We're not softening the water. We're just, mm -hmm. you know, I think their approach is they're trying to stop scale. And mm -hmm. it's percentages of, and the NACTAC, they, they study them and that can be 94% effective. But I think some of you, we call them the magnetic type. It's like a, it's, it's an attempt at electromagnet, a coil with carrying a yeah. current around a wire. They mm -hmm. probably reduce some scaling, but you're down to the 20, 30, 40 percent, you know, quite they're not particularly effective at what they're trying to do. They will prevent some scale, um, but um, you're still going to get scale because they're not they're not high on the effectiveness. Um, yes, I yeah, definitely yeah. see that. OK, great. Well, thanks yeah. for your uh, yeah. help. Great. And and I, I have to add, um, um, mention this this one little anecdote here that apparently Gulf and Region of Waterloo's boundaries has has expanded to include Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, Fadi Farah had to sign off. Uh, they said that it's three o'clock in the morning in Beirut, so they weren't able to stay any longer, and that was just a few minutes ago. Oh, so that, that's that's pretty, pretty, pretty exciting. Um, and James Gordon. Hi, James. Glad you could join us. Uh, is there a way to use a softener on uh, uh, hot water only? And I know that, Steve, if you want to jump in on this one, uh, if you have a, a hot water on demand system. Uh, so the region of Waterloo's uh, uh, incentive and, and rebate program is based on on, uh, uh, on softening just the hot water, right? And so. Uh, Unless I mean, unless I heard you wrong, but basically that water line would go into the uh, the on demand unit and move forward into the house. And so when we're, when we're talking about softening the hot water line, we're softening before it actually it, before it gets heated, right? Yeah. Um, can I make a comment here? Uh, yes, by, by um, all means. Yeah. In the, in the city of Kitchener, um, if you have a demand um, a demand on demand hot water system, and we have one. 
um, they won't, they will not rent you one if you don't have a water softener. Um, and of course, temperature accelerates thermodynamics. Um, so if you were to just, um, you'd have to be careful there that you, um, if you had hard water going into your on-demand system, it would start to scale up pretty quick. So yeah, so if you were, um, you would need to be cautious there. You could not rent an on-demand system uh, and say, oh, we've got a, um, well, if you're softening the hot only, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't want any uh, hard cold to go in there. I guess that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of a NAPTAC unit. You wouldn't want to try one of those on an on-demand, but if you're just, if you are softening the, the feed to the uh, on-demand, that would be okay. But again, it would be, you know, you would have to check if it was a rental on-demand system with the renter. Got it. Got it. Um, and, and Peter R. asks, how expensive is it to maintain a NACTAC system over time, replacing the media every, every two or three years? That's a good question. I, I think you could probably push it beyond three years, uh, is my un understanding. Um, from everything I have found, and again, because these are pretty new, there's uh, it, it goes back to the... Uh, uh, folks being uncomfortable with them not just for the sale of the home but because they are, they are a fairly new um from a household residential use perspective um that's where you don't have that's where the complaint was right there's no bells there's no whistles there's no lights to suggest that that media is spent uh and so you're you're kind of playing a balancing game um you know there are plenty of homes in the in the city there are plenty of homes in in the region of waterloo that aren't softened whatsoever um and and run hard water it it wouldn't be the it wouldn't a year of hard water wouldn't kill your system or shouldn't kill your system uh by any means so if, if you're three months late replacing it because you err on the side of caution it, it, it i i don't see that being a particular issue uh likewise let's say you were three months late and there was a little bit of scale build up well um three months after when you replace that media um, the NAC tax is going to do what it does does best uh, when you install that equipment and, and anything that's built up over that that you know short window of time is then going to be descaled when the system is is back fully functioning again. And um, Steve, if I, I can just if I can yeah. just add, um, what's recommend uh, replacing the media every three years? A study we did maybe can stretch it out to four. Um, and we had a uh, we had a um, uh, sixteen plex uh, multi res change it out and. Uh, there's a whole range of qualities. Um, you can spend four or five or six or seven or eight hundred dollars uh, on on replacing the media. So there's a cost there every every say four years. Yeah, but there is a range of qualities. There's one I was looking at the specs. Um, um, this lady um, was looking at to replace her media, and there was a whole range of qualities, mm. a range of prices. And we've got another question from Art. Uh, uh, what exactly is the environmental problem with putting extra chlorides from water softeners into our wastewater? And doesn't the chlorination of our water also do this? Um, short answer, no. Um, um, the chloride ions um, are a problem um, in, in the waste, wastewater treatment plants, apparently, um, in the, in the, the bacteria doing their work. Um, yeah, I, I guess this is a real chemistry question, but um, the form of, 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 of chlorine that um, from chlorination um, is more, oh, does dissipate. Um, that's, that's something I'd have to do some research on to give you an effective answer, but um, my understanding is sodium and chloride is rising in the aquifers. Um, and um, my understanding is the chloride is a problem in the treatment plants. But um, I see what you're saying. The chlorides, um, it does dissipate. And you're asking, why doesn't the chloride dissipate? That's something I, I guess I'd need to do some research on that to actually answer that effectively. And, and, and the, the implication of adding, uh, if I could add to that, more chlorides to, to, the, uh, to the sewage system is that eventually, even after being treated, it winds up in our rivers. And salt yeah. levels are being measured downstream, in, uh, downstream from the 
uh, sewage treatment plants in the region and in Guelph, and that's where we're seeing higher concentrations of salt. And it changes, uh, it, I mean, to get to the environmental point, Art, that it changes the predator-prey relationship when it starts impacting different keynote species in that, uh, in that food chain uh, to the extent where it starts causing uh, problems with the, uh, uh, with the whole ecosystem within the river. Um, I, we're, it looks like we're unable to, to do the poll, but can I ask all of the participants tonight if I could just ask you, here's the participatory part. In the chat, can you just write the word hot or cold? If, uh, so, and the question is, uh, what do you most often, how do you most often wash your clothes? Is it in hot water or cold water? So just put write hot or cold and we could do a quick tally if you just wanna all just write it in there and uh, Please write it before you see what everyone else says. <laughs> wow, there's quite a pattern there. That's um, that, that, that's very interesting. It's overwhelmingly cold, uh, cold or cool. Uh, James Gordon warm um, and uh, uh, do you mean tepid James? <laughs> uh, he said warm and and uh, and, and Khalid um, mentioned cold but not for COVID masks and and that, that's why I asked specifically for most of the time how to because there are times when you're going to want to use uh, when you're going to use warm or, or hot water but I that's I don't know that it's scientific um, uh, Steve and Wayne but it, it gives us a pretty good indication at least of the people that were interested to come out to this event because they're concerned about the environment and and water softeners um, and uh, on uh, on that note I'm going to I'm going to hand it over back to my to my colleague Rasha Rasha over to you yes thank you thank you uh, yes, I just want to share the results of the poll. I just released it now. So we've got 71% of people answered with cold water. And we've got 29% saying that they wash with warm. And uh, we've got 0% for hot water. <laughs> so that's the result. Okay, what an interesting discussion. Um, time flies. And uh, with this, we reach to the end of our uh, Salty Softener Salty Rivers event. Big thank you to all of our attendees for their brilliant engagement and interaction with our panelists. And now uh, we know that salt volume from our softeners is rising compared to road salt. We encourage you to take advantage of all available rebates offered by the city and to take a considerate action to reduce your demand on softeners in order to save water, salt, and of course, reduce the, the impact on the environment. Finally, a great thank you to our panelists for their valuable uh, contribution. Uh, we thank uh, Wayne uh, Brabazon from the region of Waterloo, and of course, Steve Yesley from the city of Guelph, and our sincere appreciation to the city of Guelph for sponsoring this event. Good night, everyone, and see you in our upcoming events. Yes. Okay, I will end the recording now. <laughs>